Okay, we're going to look at the most important supranationalist organizations uh, by name and function for the majority of this lecture. But before we get to those gritty details, let's kind of take a step back for one moment more to kind of figure out why these things are happening right now. We are living through the age of international organizations. They did not exist 100 years ago, much less 1,000 or 10,000 ago. This is kind of a very new phenomenon. Why is this happening right now? Now, how do these things function? What does it take for states to join a supranational organizations? Let's tackle all those one thing at a time. We're well, starting with why now? Why are these international organizations gaining in popularity uh, and in number? And by numbers, I mean there are more supranational organizations than ever before and more states are joining them than ever before. This is a trend of our times. And in fact, I will go ahead and project off into the future. I personally believe that these supranational organizations will soon supersede the sovereign state concept in their entirety, perhaps in the next hundred years, maybe even sooner. Ah, 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 I know, that sounds crazy. What a radical prediction. Perhaps, but just look at the trends of the last 60 to 70 years. All states are in at least one or two or five of these international organizations now. And it's not that much of a stretch of the imagination to understand that these are the entities that are going to be going to war with each other or heading off war with each other or doing economic business with each other or lots of other things. They are gaining in popularity. And as more and more states join these entities, you can see that in the future, yeah, that concept, this country club concept, may be more important as the base unit of power on planet Earth for politics, economics, and lots of other things. So why are these things happening right now? Why not a thousand years ago? Okay, these really are a product of the modern era, really the last 60 to 70 years. And if you want an exact date to kind of mark the start of supranational organizations, it's the end of World War II, 1945. Almost every organization that you ever heard of, that's an acronym at the global scale, uh, started after 1945, many of them just in the last 20 to 30 years. Why? What's, what happened with World War II? Well, humans have been fighting and had conflict with each other forever, ever since all of human history. Uh, people fighting people and tribe fighting tribe and then nation fighting nation. And then of course, thinking back to our politics lecture, as the whole evolution of the nation state and the sovereign state evolved, then that was the base unit of power and those are the entities that fought against each other. Well, for most of human history, no big deal. People get into wars, people die, soldiers die, it happens. But the 20th century, really gets a page turned on all of this because of the absolute epic scale of death and destruction that humanity wrought on itself during the 1900s. And I'm thinking particularly, of course, of World War I and World War II, but there was lots of other conflicts that occurred in the 20th century. It was the bloodiest century of human existence. That's not up for dispute. It's not a judgment call. More people died that century than at any given point in human history by an exponent. And it wasn't that there was more wars going on between these sovereign states. It was that the technology of humanity had increased so much that they could kill each other way better than ever before with more and more lethal devices, biological devices, and of course all the way up to atomic and nuclear devices. I think about this, one dude in one plane with one nuclear bomb dropping over Hiroshima, wiping out 100,000 people like that. That had never been the case for all of human history. So that is really what changed and what was new. And people in the 20th century, states, sovereign states, leaders of sovereign states, started to look around going, holy crap, we need to start our having our states work together because we're not going to survive a World War III. And in fact, even after World War I, which was bloody enough, many people across the planet started to say, hey, we should have some sort of greater entity over top of the sovereign state uh, that will head off future conflicts to help us work together, uh, help our states work together more. And that's when they tried to form the League of Nations that I referred to a few lectures back in uh, 1919. Now, it didn't really work out that well because the United States in particular said, what do we care about that? This whole idea of supranational organizations was new. I mean, wildly new in 1919. So not all sovereign states bought into it, the United States in particular. The world had to wait around for World War II to come about with even greater death and destruction before even the United States and pretty much everybody said, holy crap, 
we need to get serious about this. Now that we have nuclear weapons, atomic weapons, it, the world cannot survive another major conflict like this. We need to start working together more and now. And that's when you had the kind of biggest, most important one, the United Nations formed up in 1945, 1946. Again, mostly to have states sitting around a table together to try to head off future conflicts, stabilize the world, peace, love, and all that happy horseshit. Now, I like to point this out because it's really important to understanding how today's world's functioning to get the timeline here. It's at the end of World War II when supranationalist organizations really started. And not just the United Nations, but lots of subcommittees of the United Nations, things like the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, global institutions of banking rose up at this time. And here's why it's important. Who fought World War II? Uh, who won World War II? Who lost World War II? Who were the people in charge of World War II? The answer to all these are the Western powers, the Europeans and the Americans. So why is that so important to point out? These Western powers were really kind of in charge of planet Earth at the time. I'm using that term lightly. But the Western powers were really at their apex, their peak of global economic and political power. Now, yes, the Europeans had controlled all the world during their colonial era. The Europeans controlled Africa and South America and most of Asia. But and that was kind of on the downturn. They were losing all their colonial holdings after World War II. But they still had mass control over lots of things, and they were the richest countries on the planet. The Europeans and the Americans, by far, the richest. They controlled the global economy. They had the main political powers, the main big militaries of the planet. Why is that important for our story of supranationalist organizations? Because at the conclusion of World War II, when the Western powers started the United Nations, started the IMF, started the World Bank, and a host of other things like NATO, they're the ones who started these things. Therefore, they were in the positions of leadership in all of these institutions. The West started and ran all the supranationalist organizations at the time, right on up into kind of the current era. So think about this. At the conclusion of World War II, uh, China had been destroyed. They'd been uh, wreaked with 200 years of civil war and destruction, so they were not a major power. India itself was still a colony of Britain at the conclusion of World War II, so they were not in this. Uh, all of Africa was still under colonial holdings. They weren't part of any of this. The Middle East was chaotic and weak during this period. So it's the Western powers which created these institutions which have been dominated by the Western powers ever since. Ha! Huh. See why it's important now? So when we think about all these global institutions of politics and finance and economy and lots of other things, even military, the biggest, baddest ones are still Western dominated. But, but, that is changing fast in today's world with the rise of India and China and lots of other entities in the world have, who have kind of looked around and said, why are the US and European powers in charge of everything? What's the point of that? These are global institutions now and you have lots of global powers rising. And so there are new supranationalist organizations being formed that are not Western centered or Western controlled. And I'll point out the SCO very quickly here. But on top of that, even the ones that have been Western uh, centered and Western controlled for a very long time are restructuring themselves wildly to conform to a wider, bigger picture of the world in the 21st century. And I'm thinking of things like the UN, which they're talking about restructuring the Permanent Security Council, or even the IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund. They are starting to let uh, Chinese and Indian investors be part of that. So these things are changing rapidly in today's world, but they have been Western dominated for most of the last 50 to 60 years. Okay. On to the next thing. What does a state got to do to get into one of these clubs, these country clubs? You got to pay some dues. There's no getting around that. Even if you were to go join a true like country club to go play golf, you got to pay some dues. You're going to have to pay some money to be in the club. Hell, if you're in the chess club at school, you know, you're going to play some chess. Yeah, you're going to have to pay some dues every year to be in the club. And sovereign states have to pay some dues as well to be part of these bigger institutions, bigger clubs. They might pay money, most of them do, but what's much, much, much more important that I do want you to kind of jot down on your brain is that for any state to join an international organization, 
it must pay some dues in terms of a little bit of their sovereignty. Whoa! What? <laughs> what do you mean they give up sovereignty? You mean if the United States joins uh, NATO, they give up sovereignty? No, 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 they don't give up full sovereignty. But any state that's going to be part of a larger entity by joining the club is agreeing to play by the rules of the club, be it the UN or NATO or anything else. Now, if you're agreeing to play by the rules, a set of rules that somebody else has made, then you are giving up a little bit of control over your own sovereign affairs. Do you understand that? Just a little bit, just a smidgen, because you're not, of course, going to allow, uh, you know, France, who's in NATO, to come in the United States and do something to your citizens just because you're part of NATO. But you're agreeing to play by the rules of NATO, which means you're giving up some of the decision-making process over your affairs. Again, just a smidgen. But that is the price that has to be paid. Not all states think that the price is worth it. Almost everybody's in the United Nations. Vatican City's not. They've said, no, we, it's not worth it. Uh, if for any state to join an international organization, they have to perceive that the benefits outweigh the cost of entry, the dues. And Vatican City said, no, we don't need to join the UN. There's nothing in that for us. There's no gain. We're not doing it. A better example would be the European Union and Switzerland. Everybody seems to have wanted to be in the European Union because everybody gets richer when you join the European Union. And there's more trade and more stuff going on. But Switzerland is not a member of the European Union. It said, no thanks. We're already rich. Why would we give up even this much sovereignty for what benefit? We're already richer than you. So don't assume all states want into every club because many of the states say, hey, the cost of admission is too high. We don't want to give up uh, control over our affairs to get into that club. It won't benefit us that much. This also gets the heart of why a lot of people in the United States absolutely hate the United Nations. In fact, many U.S. politicians, mostly on uh, the, the center-right conservative side, absolutely hate the United Nations because they say, we're the most powerful nation on the planet. What the hell do we got to join the UN for? We're not, we, we didn't vote for those people. We don't want to play by their rules. We don't have to. We're so powerful. We don't got to. So why should we? And this really kind of seeps down into a lot of the mindset of most Americans. I think many Americans do not like the whole concept of the United Nations. Why do we? We're powerful. We don't need to play by those rules. Why should we? Ha, ah, okay. So different people perceive benefits and cost of the entry to international organizations in different ways. Got it? Okay. Now, I've been throwing around some acronyms already. United Nations and the European Union, uh, even NATO. These are all supranationalist organizations, but they all don't have the same mission. Remember, all of these entities have something, some reason for existence, the reason why states would give up a little sovereignty to join this club. And I roughly break it down into three major types, three major reasons for existence for supranationalist organizations. By far and away, the number one is money slash economics. The majority of supranationalist organizations around on planet Earth today are based on money, on economics, on trade. Everybody joins the club under the perception that you're going to trade more, you're going to do more, everybody's going to make more money. This is a good club. We like clubs where we make more money. And that is the number one reason why these places or these institutes exist and states join them. The number two, and perhaps even more important reason for the existence of a supranational organization is uh, safety slash defense defensive organizations where states get together and say, hey, we're going to be in this club together. We all agree to protect each other. Uh, or in the case of the United Nations, uh, we're all going to be in this club together to try to head off conflict. So defense is the number two reason why states would join a supranational organization. Number three is a bit more nebulous, a little tricky. And that is that there are some supranational organizations which aren't based on making more money or defense, but they there are states that get together because they have some sort of cultural commonality. That is, they say, hey, we're all the same types of people, or we all believe in these things together, and we should get in a club and work together to promote or push uh, our culture more and to just work together in general for our common cause or our common culture. And this is kind of funny ones like the Arab League maybe you've heard of. Uh, so money, defense, cultural commonality are the major reasons why these organizations form. However, there are a hell load of what I call oddballs. 
There are all kinds of other acronyms you've heard uh, a reference to that you're like, what the hell is a G7, G20, uh, the nuke club brick? Uh, these are clubs, kind of, but they aren't legit like the other ones are. They're not, they don't have, say, a written constitution or a written set of rules. And quite frankly, because they're not legit and there's no structure to them formed up, the states don't have to give up even a modicum of sovereignty as dues to get into them because they're, again, they're not really solid, but they are quite important. And the ones I will reference are the G's. You've heard of the G7, the G8. Now, the G20 is the big one. Uh, or the Nuke Club, those countries that are uh, nuclear armed. And BRIC, B-R-I-C, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China. Well, hell, that's just a fun acronym, but is that a, a legit club? Oh, not yet, but it's getting there. And all of these things are quite important affecting world events. But with no reservations, economics is far and away the most important reason that countries get together to play in a bigger country club. And as a driver of globalization itself, it kind of makes sense that the biggest motivator of states to work together is also economics. So let's start with economics first, and let's do that now.